This is the Director's Podcast with Jeff T. Thomas, Part 2. So let's start with your process first. How do you think your process from script to screen has changed, is different today to the way it was when you got your first gig? Well, I just know so much more. Uh, I think that's the number one way. But the number two thing is I know what I don't know now, which I didn't admit earlier on. So I really know my limitations. I know what I'm weak at, and I know that I can ask for help, and I know that help will arrive. I did not understand that when I began. I thought I had to have all the answers by the time the day of shooting happens, and for every actor and for every situation, I'm the director, and I need to know. And what I realize now is even though I know a lot more, I also know I know a lot less. And by knowing a lot less, I've found myself empowering others to really participate. So I think that's the biggest change. I've also seen just a lot more films. I mean, I, and I'm influenced today by people that weren't really influences when I was younger. I mean, we talked in part one about, you know, Ingmar Bergman, and I have to say, you know, even Woody Allen was an influence. We talked about black exploitation and Steven Spielberg. But, you know, then in more recent days, it's been a continuing influence of Robert Altman, a continuing influence of Ridley Scott. When it comes to procedurals, we're always trying to see what would Ridley Scott do uh, to tell this story because of the way that he shoots and 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 still reveals humanity in, in beauty. Um uh, you know, Taiko Atiti nowadays is just like, I just want to do everything like he does. I want to have the approach that he does and the wryness infused in all my work and Christopher Nolan and David O. Russell. So now there are filmmakers out there that inspire me to take things in a different direction. Um, I do tend to avoid the more stylized filmmakers. I'm not a big David Fincher fan. I like him personally, but I, I don't always engage in his films in the same way that others do. I definitely don't why, why is that, do you think? Uh, because I see the hand of the director so conspicuously that I am mostly interested in it esoterically or or how it was constructed as opposed to what it is. And I feel the same way about Quentin Tarantino. I'm very interested in how he bends the genre and what he does with a shot, but I'm not interested in the movie. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. find that those techniques draw me in the way Ridley Scott does, mm-hmm. Ridley and Tony too, but Ridley Scott tends to, you know, if you look at The Martian, use all of that sophistication and all those techniques that he's mastered to pull me into the stories. Um, Spielberg is this way too, although sometimes he can get a little bit ostentatious, but it's rare. So I'm always looking at directors that I admire, like David O. Russell, I think, where technique seems to just completely underscore, elevate, uh, bring to the fruition the story they're trying to tell. And those have become my eyes. But Spielberg can be extremely stylistic, though, no? I mean, yeah, no, he can. But senior, you know. But generally, it's, uh, it's 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 you know, if you look at Schindler's List and what he did there versus Jurassic Park, sure. you know that the style yeah. is so in service of the drama. Uh, I don't feel it's extraneous or applied. I don't feel the shot came first. I feel like what mm-hmm. came first was what he wanted to draw you to emotionally or just visually what he wanted you to focus on is is the focus with with some other filmmakers is just the showiness seems to distract mm, for me which i believe is his process um but what is your process i mean when you get the script do you have a moment where you solely focus on the script or do you storyboard do you come up with ideas what what is that do you absorb the story first do you have an imagination process what is what is your process from the moment you start reading well it's 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 calcified now pretty much um what i do is when i get a script of an episode or film i just want to sit down in one sitting and read it i don't want to be interrupted i don't want to get up and have coffee i want to prepare myself just to experience it like I'm watching it as a movie. And so I try not to make notes. I try to just read it from beginning to end and just absorb this is what the story is and feel it more kind of in an overview thematic way than a very specific way. That done, I take a break. Uh, Usually I wait until the next day and then I open it up again and I take copious notes. 
Then I start saying, okay, what are going to, what are my challenges going to be? What are the locations I need? What are the big set pieces we're going to have to start working on on day one? Where's the casting at it? Sometimes it's notes about the scene. Sometimes it's notes about things I have to get into right away. Now I use scriptation, which I absolutely love. So I can just actually just feed them right into scriptation and I use different colors and I get very, very detailed about it. Prep goes on, I start answering more questions. I ask people for more help to solve those particular problems. And somewhere around the second or third day of prep, I start to shot list the movie. And the way that I do that is I start from scene one and I go to the last scene. I literally will make a shot list of the entire film, really keeping in mind how the transitions will work, how one sh uh, one scene will flow into another. And that's why something like the pilot of Pitch looks the way it does, because I shot listed it from beginning to end. It's not a storyboard. It's just a detailed description of how I imagine these shots to be in each scene. And then my assistant will take them and put them on the days that the scenes are scheduled. And then I'll look at them again and say, oh my God, I have too much to do in a single day and retool <laughs> the shot list to actually make the day do you, possible. Do you shot list things like conversations, like two people sitting in a room I do. having a conversation? Yeah, you do? I never want them to quite be exactly what you would totally expect. Sometimes they have to be because time is of the essence and you have to speed through them. But I think every scene deserves an idea, an idea that reinforces the scene. So where the camera's placed, how the camera moves, even in a two-person conversation is worth your consideration. Will they be close together? Will you accent the space between them? Will the overs be tight and will they block each other or will they be open? Will you shoot them all as singles where you know, you're know you on a wider lens and closer to them? Or will you be longer and, and squeeze them together? Will you circle with the steady cam? Will you find them originally and stay there? Will you shoot things in between? You know, even the simplest conversation, and obviously I did 36 episodes of In Treatment, so I had a lot of experience with this, yeah. uh, demands yeah. rigorous attention from the director. Mm, and, you know, obviously being on set where actors will want to do things slightly differently, they might not want to stand up at a point where the script says, or sit down or walk around or do something. They might have their own ideas. Obviously, you're, would you try to manipulate them into your shot list or would you just let your shot list evolve into following what they want to do as well or meet in the middle? What's your, what's your process? Such a good there? question. The purpose of my shot list is not to dictate to people what will happen. It's to have a plan in case nothing happens. So it's only the worst case scenario, my shot list. It's sometimes it is specific shots that I really do want to accomplish. But generally, it's the beginning of a conversation. And that conversation then goes, I send the shot list in advance to the first AD and to the DP. And now to our line producer, who I really trust to give me feedback. And they give me notes and ideas, and sometimes they don't at all. And then we arrive on the day. I don't bring the shot list out and say it. I just ask the actors to start where I think they should start. And we fall into the scene, and we rehearse very loosely. And most of the time, 70% of the time, they more or less fall into uh, a staging that will be accommodated by my shots. Sometimes they don't, and it's better. And I gleefully mm -hmm. accept it and change my shots. Sometimes they don't and it's worse. And I gently coax them to doing something that is better. And often we find amongst us something even better than what the shot list imagined. Um, I've been working a lot with Darren Okada, who's a great uh, DP now. Darren is a master of subtly contributing and improving every scene that I've shot listed. So he suddenly says, oh, I see you had a handheld or a dolly with a loose head here. What if we did this or that? Or what if we moved it in this way? Or what if we brought that? And everything is just a little bit enhanced. He is like um, delicious spice on every enchilada. I don't know why I said enchilada. Talking about, so, to, <laughs> talking about subtly influencing, if you find that you're on set and you have two actors... Well, say you have four actors mm -hmm. and three of those actors are hitting it. There are 10 in the rehearsal. The fourth actor isn't doing it. How do you, do you, do you like to direct people individually? Do you do it as a group? Is it scene dependent? Uh, what, what, what would you do in a situation? Well, it's that? scene dependent and actor dependent. I, I, in my directing class, I always say to the young directors that you have to understand that every actor needs a different director. They don't need the same director, which means you, as the director, have to be many directors. And you have to be able to address 
in the language that that particular understand that particular actor will understand what your issues and notes are. And the more and the better you can do this, the more accomplished you'll be. I use this as an example NYPD Blue, where I had Jimmy Smits, who was a very not method, but very internal, thoughtful, uh, developing it from the script really takes painstaking notes and thoughts about each scene. And Dennis Franz, who, though highly successful as Sipwitz, it was absolutely a costume. Sipwitz was just something he put on with the short sleeve shirt. He, he didn't feel anything that Sipwitz felt, and he didn't have to, to win four Emmys in a row being Sipwitz. It was just completely um, a fabrication. So I could tell him yo, wake up, Dennis, you know, we need a seven here, and you're only giving us a five. And he would say he would get it totally and do that. But you can't say that to Jimmy Smits. You have to be able to really talk about the motivations and the characters and what's going on. So with each actor, there's a different way of conversing. Sons of Anarchy was another perfect example. The actors were so broadly different. One was an actual Hell's Angel. Some are Scottish actors. Some are Charlie Hunnam, who is just a force of nature and a fantastic director that you can really you know play with for days and they'll come up with all sorts of new things so you have to figure out who you're talking to and how to talk to them it's very difficult to talk to that particular cast as a group because they're all super different so it it depends on the collection of people how their styles mesh and what you really want to accomplish if it really is hey we all need to hurry up because we're losing the light it's one thing but if it's internal motivations you have to figure out what the actor needs so how do you do that? Do you ask one of the actors to come for a walk with you? Do you try to say it subtly while they're going back to your first looks or, or last looks? What are you? Well, if it's a show I'm on, I know. I mean, if it's a show I've yeah. done the pilot and I've cast the actors, I know kind of how they work. If it's a show I'm not on, I try to do as much intel as possible. I can surmise from watching many actors what their style is, but then I go to other directors who've directed or to the producer director or to the writers and say, how does this person work? And when all that research is done, before I shoot them, I go and meet them. And I say, hey, how can I be most helpful to you as a director? What really, what, what do you like that a director does? And what, what, do you, what bothers you? I want to be the most useful director to you. And I get have a conversation with them. And that's really helpful. And they're always surprised. Like, nobody ever does that. And I think, why don't they just ask you? I mean, it seems very simple, but uh, that's what I do. I did that. I did um, for season one on Wayward Pines, actually. And uh, that was uh, a show which started off strong and then it shut down and then it started again. And the day before, I just called up Melissa Leo, Matt Dillon, Terrence Howard, all those actors, just to have that rapport. So we didn't meet and have our first conversation, the, you know, the, day, the first day of uh, principal filming. So um, I found that that really helped, just for them to know that you're looking out for them also. And nowadays with uh, Zoom and masks, it's probably the only time they'll see you. And so on a series, yeah. we're bringing new directors in and we say, you got to Zoom with each of the actors just so they see your face and can imagine what you look like. Otherwise, you'll come down to the set and they will never sort of see your smile. They'll never know who you are behind that mask. You need to introduce yourself at the very beginning as how you look and, and use the Zoom and then we'll go from there. Yeah. And uh, just one last question on that process. Um, you mentioned Ridley Scott. Ridley is somebody that we know loves to use a lot of cameras. Um, sometimes you'll use four, sometimes you'll use more in a scene. Um, some actor, some directors like to uh, do a lot of takes, some just as many as it takes, some like the energy, like Eastwood, like to only do two takes. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Yes to a lot of cameras, no to a lot of takes. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is my quick answer. It, it varies in situations. I mean, in, in, in pitch, sometimes we had 10 cameras, but that's baseball. I mean, we're doing baseball and we wanted to capture it all in the field and we don't want to do it a million times. And we're also in major league stadiums taking up their precious time. So, uh, uh, but on, in general, I'd like to have two to three cameras. On our show currently, Station 19, it's a three camera show. Um, and I like them to actually be useful. I like to really utilize the three cameras in my shot list. I'll go 1A, 1B, 1C, and then Darren will change it somewhat, but I will have a plan for each of the cameras. So that they're always shooting, not just extraneous stuff that we might use or that might help us, but they really have a part of the story. 
So I like to use cameras in multiple ways, and I like to have DPs who can light for that. Um, and I, you don't always get that, but that's what I like. Mm -hmm. In terms of takes, I don't think, I, I can't do 60 takes, David Fincher. I've never done that mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, I After five or six or seven at the most, I tell the uh, script supervisor, change the slate. I mean, I don't want to see seven, eight, <laughs> nine, ten uh, takes in here. Uh, but that rarely happens. Generally, if if we've done too many takes, I feel the actor's getting fatigued and I'm not getting the best, despite what Mr. Fincher tells you. So I will then change the shot a little bit and, and focus on that to let the actor feel relieved and let them know they have accomplished something. Now we're doing something else. Even if I'm just moving in a few mils or slightly shifting the camera, I will do that just to sort of let some of the air out. If I'm not quite getting the performance, I'll refresh them by moving the camera just a wee bit or moving another actor and then try it again. So sometimes I, I do slight adjustments to have additional takes that are slightly different, um, which tends to please me more in the editing room. Um, do you cross cover as well, or is it uh, scene by scene? We do. We cross on, cover on, sta on Station 19. Yeah, on Station 19, we cross cover quite a bit because of the way the actors and their spontaneity, but also because Darren Okada can do that. And we, I, I see to him if there's a situation where I can't cross cover and make it look decent, I just won't do it. But if I can, or if I have to change the staging of it to make it easier for him to do it, I'll do that too. So we try to sort of balance it. We don't want the show to look shitty. We want the show to look good. So I don't want to just do things and turn it all into a four camera comedy. So uh, we, we try to strike a balance with that. Now, three pilots that you've done um, recently, that you've directed recently, The Bastard Executioner, which was shot in Wales, my home, my home country, um, wow. Station 19 and Pitch, three vastly different looking shows. Is it your style? It's what it sounds like from speaking to you a little bit now. It all stems from the story um, rather than doing that thing that uh, other directors may do and they try to force their style onto a project. Mm -hmm. Is your style, does it come from the story and, and, and or does it come from the showrunner or does it come from a little bit of both? Um, I think it's very limiting to just keep doing the same thing and call it your signature. I never did that in music mm -hmm. videos. I doubt that you did it either. Um, my whole feeling is if I'm a director, what I want to do is bring out the truth and the emotion out of whatever the script is that I'm given. And that emotion and truth will form itself in terms of a, six series, a series of shots after I read and study it and get deeply into the mind of the creator of it. So Pitch is a perfect example. And Pitch, Dan Fogelman, who I had met before that, and Rick Singer, who wrote it as originally uh, as a movie, had a very, very specific feeling of it in, uh, when, they, when they actually created it, which was this combination of Fox television and real life Ginny Baker uh, under the skin. And I like that, but I said, how do I bring that to life? How do I make that happen? And we finally jointly decided to do one of the things is early on to have a very long one-er, an Anai 2 one-er that started from her in her hotel room to her getting into her vehicle to go to Petco Park. And we would appear not to cut. And we would travel with her and we would see the world kind of through her eyes and walk with her on that momentous day. Um, and there, from the story, from the character, from working with the writers, things like that, we came up with a kind of daunted shot that we thought would take us a full day and end up only taking half a day because we had rehearsed it. And, and Yasu Tanita, who was the DP, had um, worked it out so well and shot the shot himself that it all worked out. But it, a little bit of it is, what's the central heating of the work? What's the central heating of the bastard executioner? By the way, Wales was still one of the best experiences of my life. The year that I spent in Wales will never be forgotten and has never been forgotten by my family. Um, we actually really, really loved the country. Um, the people were fantastic to us. We loved staying in Cardiff. Um, and the shooting of it and traveling over the countryside to go to the different locations we did in Bastard Executioner was um, just a joy. So yes, I would go to England and, and especially Wales to do another show in a heartbeat if you know anyone. Um, but be that as it said, with the Bastard Executioner, now we're in medieval times, we're chopping off heads, <laughs> There's magic. It's strange. It's very violent. It's, it's extremely, extremely violent. Extremely violent yeah. from the get-go. Something, that, by the way, which I don't love. I didn't love it about mm -hmm. it. I didn't think we needed to go there. John Landgraf and I kind of agreed on that. 
but our showrunner had a very specific vision for the level of violence that he wanted to create in this world. And that's what you see in the screen, which um, is gory and extreme, and I think hurt us in the, in, the, in the first episode because a lot of people were just repulsed by it, um, which is too bad because they're really great characters and a great story that developed yeah. over the course of, I think, those 10 episodes we did that, that some people never went on the trip for. So um, it's central heating. It's figuring out what the showrunner's vision is, and then it's figuring out, now, how can I top that? How can I do it without being ostentatious? How can I take that central heating and elevate it? I mean, In Treatment is a great example because I came into In Treatment in the middle of season one, and I'm not an executive producer, and I didn't do the pilot, and season one had established a look which was quite slow dallies. Occasionally, mm -hmm. at a certain point, every 10 minutes, they would cross behind the person, and there would be a new line created, so you'd look at them as quite elegant, what Rodrigo had done. Mm -hmm. But the script mm -hmm. I was handed was nothing like that. The script when I was, hand I was handed Blair Underwood's just completely gets under the skin of Paul, the therapist, until Paul throws coffee in his face and they almost come to fisticuffs. So I turned to Rodrigo and I said, I'm not sure this is going to... Oh, sorry, I'm on a podcast. You can't see my fingers slowly moving apart and drifting together. <laughs> um, but, but And so he allowed me to go handheld and he allowed me to loosen the heads and the dollies and he allowed me to break the form of the show for that episode um, because the story demanded it. And the story was a big explosion, and, and, and that's what we did. And that, you know, we Emmy nominations and things like that um, ensued, and DGA nominations for me. And part of it is because we were still true to what the story was, even though we were outside of the genre of the of the episode. It ended up getting me to be a producer on that show. I was, I was lasted for all three seasons and did lots of episodes, and no episode is quite the same. How would you say your approach um, directing a network television job compares to something like In Treatment, which was HBO. Well, yeah, it's pretty much the same nowadays. It used to be that network television was more driven by a CBS style of procedurals because that was sort of the box that network television had decided it wanted to live in in order to collect the you know mass audience it desired. But now network television wants to be cable and wants to be pay and wants to be streaming and so they're really looking for something that's more dynamic and more cinematic than they were before so the shows are kind of exploding in their ambition so now network television is cascading with its rivals to become you know as compelling cinematically now i know that's not true on every show i do uh i don't watch a ton of network television shows other than ones i'm working on so my understanding is that you know there's a world in which cinema doesn't exist and it's a lot of close-ups but <laughs> in the world that i've been living in in shantaland mm -hmm. uh, there's been a desire to make it little movies and make each week as crisp yeah. and as well put together as a film but you still have to take into account if you're if you're if you have a show on hbo or, or you know on one of the networks that doesn't have a commercial break you don't have to worry about ending that act you know, with that big bang like you do if you're doing a network television show and you know you're going to have five minutes of commercials if it's CBS and it's only a 44 minute cut that you deliver. So it's, I presume that you, did you look at it like that or do you? Uh... Yeah, I think that's just one of the, you know, sort of nuanced differences. And when I'm doing my shot list, I always make end act one, open act four as a note just to myself within the shot list to know I must have a shot to conclude this act. I must have a vision of what that final moment of the act before the commercial will be. I must have a shot to begin this act. So you do have to think a little bit more conscientiously about that mm -hmm. and drawing the audience and keeping them involved. So there is that. It's slightly tedious, admittedly, because sometimes you're drumming up drama in order to create suspense later. And a lot of that suspense gets thrown out in the editing room when you decide this scene shouldn't end the act at all, mm -hmm. and another scene should. So you try your best to do that, and it does take up more time than it should, but that is that is one major difference with network television. Absolutely. So let's talk about um, some of the more defining moments in your career. You've already had a fantastic career with so many, you know, Emmys, we haven't even got into the Emmys and your awards and everything as yet. So I presume there are some of the highlights, but what are some of the, the you know, the moments you like to reflect on a little bit, uh, the least as well? 
It's, it's super obvious that winning the Emmy for the first time would be a career highlight, but when I was thinking about this, I couldn't think of a greater highlight in terms of my directorial career because I was still quite young. I'd maybe done 20, maybe 25 episodes of television when I won the first Emmy, so I didn't I didn't really um, have a great body of work. And suddenly I'm at the Emmys first with my mother and my my family, and which is amazing. I'm nominated, incredible. Uh, I'm nominated, you know, with an incredible people that I super admired, including David Chase for The Sopranos. And I'm thinking, what the hell is gonna happen? Am I gonna win? If I win, I'm not gonna win. The episode was not um, particularly you know, I don't know, different from anything else. It just was about a, son, a, a father who is a millionaire father, by the way, who was molesting his child and the wife was covering up for it. Um, it was moving and it was emotional, uh, but I didn't think it was necessarily going to be the show. And sure enough, boom, the envelope opens. And the first thing Roma Downey says is, the Emmy goes to, it's a tie. It's a tie. I'm thinking in my seat. Is it a tie? <laughs> the first Emmy goes to Mark Tinker for Brooklyn South. And so Mark Tinker, who is my partner in NYPD Blue, had taken some time off to direct another pilot for David Milch for Brooklyn South, goes up and gets the Emmy. And he talks for a really long time. <laughs> so now I think... You know, we're, there's down to four of us. Somebody's going to get a second Emmy. We're waiting for Mark Tinker to finish. And Mark Tinker finishes finally. And Roma Downey comes back to the microphone and says, and the second Emmy goes to Paris Barkley. She sounds a lot like Elizabeth Taylor in my impressions. But anyway, so uh, I go scampering up there. I have prepared a speech, but I haven't written it down because I've decided to use the Emmy statue itself as a memory jogging mnemonic for my speech. So uh, I get up there. I get to hug Jimmy Smith's on the way. I, I, you know, see my mother clapping and standing. I get to thank those people. And uh, in one minute, I managed to thank all the important people, including David Milch, including my family, and recognize my sobriety getting me to where I've done, and all of it without actually looking at a card or a piece of paper, wow. which I'm super proud wow. of. Um, and I also looked really great in a suit that the costumer friend YPD Blue had made for me and now was an Emmy-winning director, one of the few men of color or people of color at all who had won the Emmy for directing. Although there had been others, I was not the first, um, which made me sort of suddenly a part of the Pantheon. Um, so that was mm -hmm. probably my greatest moment. And even winning the Emmy again the second year, and you know, it was great, because it was a great episode where Jimmy Smith actually died, but the first Emmy is the one that is probably the highlight. It says both for NYPD Blue. Both for NYPD Blue, yes, yeah. 20 years yeah. ago. But who's counting? Uh, did that change your career? Uh, you know, obviously, it's, I think it did, right? Yeah, I haven't really not worked uh, since that time. I've always had a job, um, unless I wanted to not work. I've always managed to uh, stay employed. I had other things brought to me. I had pilots that came my way, and I started to be able to choose the jobs that I wanted to do. So in that sense, it definitely changed it, but also made expectations that much higher for the work that I would do, so I was harder on myself because of it. Some of the uh, other more defining moments? The worst, uh, which I've also referred to, is getting fired. I'm not a person who likes getting fired, as I I've discussed. So when I was removed from House Party 2 unceremoniously, uh, it was one of the worst moments. And it really shook my faith in myself. I mean, I didn't see it as, oh my God, these producers have defrauded me. I saw it as I've made an incredible failure. And the lesson I've learned in retrospect is, you know, sometimes it's not about you. <laughs> sometimes it's really about you are the victim of what other people want. And you don't have to take all that pain on. You don't have to take that you weren't right for the right time, meaning you aren't right as a person internally. So that was a really bad experience and I was ill-equipped to deal with it. And it took me quite a long time to recover from it. So I think that goes down and history is one of my worst. How do you come to that conclusion? Um, just looking back on it and having other experiences that were nearly as bad and being able to deal with them in a much more graceful and gracious way because I recognize that, you know, it's just not all about me. It's just not, mm -hmm. um, despite mm -hmm. what I may think. In wise words. Um, but the most memorable show that I've worked on in, in terms of, of, of what we talked about and the oh. one that I want, well, it's a sort of a tie. Glee was very memorable. Glee was a, 
a special one. I think I did eight episodes of that. Every episode was different. The music was so awesome. And Ryan Murphy is the producer of my dreams in that after the first episode, he pretty much, you know, let me go. Uh, and I got to do whatever I wanted to do, more or less. But I love the stories. I love the fusion of music and dancing and the music and video stuff there. comes back, yeah, you know. Yeah, you go yeah. back to your roots. At the same time, the cast became close friends. And it was really quite uh, uh, a magical time to be doing something that so many people were watching too and then the other side there was in treatment which you know there were 72 or so episodes made i directed 36 of them um and that was a, that's a huge amount of half hours but just the actors you know dane dehan and, and amy ryan and of course gabriel Byrne himself but you know also, Blair Underwood was magnificent throughout that. Allison Pill. There were just, it was just a door of incredible talent. Irfan Khan and the season we had uh, him, God rest his soul, was um, a joy to watch and taught me a lot about acting um, just in mm -hmm. watching him. So I think in shows that developed me and treatment developed me to become a much better director and a much more sensitive director to actors and their performance because of the grueling intensity of doing those episodes every two days with uh, mm. a new actor. Wow, that's so. what you did, every two days for yeah, 20 they were, minutes? Yeah, yeah, each episode was two days. No, they tended to be, HBO didn't have a set ending time for them, so they were 20 to 28 minutes. In some cases, right. they were shorter, or we could actually edit them down, so they did not have to be a half hour. So uh, we, we worked on those things to be, the, they, they ended up being the time they needed to be. Diane Weiss always ended up filling the time because there is, nothing but joy and nuance in every facial expression she makes but other actors we could trim down because they you know they didn't fill the time like diane weiss did watching uh, you know watching your pilots i also thought you know station 19 i was surprised at the level of emotion you managed to get there in such a short amount of time and introducing so many characters also talking about pitch there, there's one thing i would like to ask you here i i noticed at the end of Pitch, I thought you made a great choice when there's the car accident and you don't see the car accident in detail. You see the lead up to the car accident and then you see the aftermath of the car accident. Could you speak about that a little bit? Because I know that especially people that maybe don't have a lot of experience, they might feel like if they were ever presented a moment like that, they would prob they might feel like they'd have to shoot it and, and see it in many other ways. Could you just talk a bit about your the decision of not to... I know it's not about the accident, it's more about the what happens after the accident. Could you just talk a little bit about how you came to that decision? It was never scripted to actually show the accident, and I was pleased. Right. Um, because Fogelman and Singer uh, knew and how they envisioned it that the power of memory would be stronger if it was suggested rather than shown. Um, so I completely, I mean, I didn't just do it because I had not unlimited funds, but we had 15 or so million dollars to make that pilot. So we could have absolutely done the accident if we wanted to. But mm -hmm. the the precursor and aftermath of it to us with just the lights shining in the in the windshield was enough to suggest the power of it. Then we didn't have to go through the whole crunching of metal and the bloodiness of it all. Um, and I think that was a smart choice for that type of show. It doesn't wallow in that so level of violence. If we were doing it for Netflix, if Ryan Murphy were doing it, we would approach it differently. But the sensibility of those two writers never included uh, seeing that level of violence. I think it, I think it helped as well because it allowed you to stay on that same level, you know, the loving relationship between father and daughter, and it didn't take you out of that, which is, you know, in, in real life, in a relationship, if something like that happens, that's such a small amount of time compared to the time invested in that relationship. It's a really good until point. that point. So I really, I, I watched it and I was like, that was by far the best way to do that and very rarely do I watch something and you know something like that stands out to me so I congratulate yeah, you it did that. we did go back and forth in editing with it quite a lot trying to get it just right in terms of the balance of it all but but that was always mm. the concept it's beautifully executed so today's president's day um <laughs> you were also the president of the dga former president former Thank president you. yes former president yeah could you just talk a little bit about that uh i never intended to be the president of the dga but i did like to contribute because early in my career some of the first shows i did i needed the dj's involvement to protect my creative rights they stepped up i mean i had shows where people were cutting around me i had conflicts with producers that needed needed the DJ's assistance, they were always there. 
Um, and then I shortly realized that having the insurance and having the protections of the DJ was incredibly valuable to my family as time would go on. And I felt I should give back. And so I started participating and becoming involved in the committees and eventually the councils. And then when they decided because Obama's president, we need to have a black president too, to elect me as president. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was an extension of how I could be of service. So I tried to make it more easy to communicate with our members. I tried to deal the, with the negotiations and focus them on streaming, which was obviously the future at that time. I, I had a lot of challenges in front of me. It was the time of the Sarah Jones accident. It was a very difficult uh, time to sort yeah. of to get through all of that and to return safety as a high priority for all DGA members. And so uh, I was very, very pleased and privileged and to be honored with, I mean, Frank Capra was president of DGA. I mean, Robert Wise yeah, was the president incredible. of DGA. It's like, holy moly, yeah. Michael Apted, my friend, was the president of the DGA. So it was, a, it was a big honor, but I figured I would just use it to try to do as many things that would really impact the members in a, in a favorable way as possible. And it was exhausting and time consuming. And a lot of it happened when I was in Wales, uh, when I was doing the bastard executioner. Right. I was the president and I'd fly back for important board meetings and then get back on the plane to Wales. And it was it was um, it added a lot of stress to my life and took a lot of hours away from my kids. But I don't think I would do it again differently to have that on top. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, you've, yeah. You're already working an 18-hour day, yeah, you know, and to add that on top of that in another country, oh my God! I don't know how yeah, it was. It was. I think Sons of Anarchy and Glee, and a little bit of entreatment when I first started, I think, and then it became, you know, largely the bastard executioner through the back end of it. It was. It was a lot. Um, the DJ is a big. It's not. It's not a needy membership, but the um, the structure of the DJ tries to be of service, even constantly. So it, it ended up being a lot more time than I had hoped for. Well, you did a fantastic job. And <laughs> Thank you. All in your debt for doing that. Thank you so much. So um, moving on to our third question in part two. If you were to start from the beginning again, what would you do differently? Uh, I would have kept my focus on writing as well as directing because I've been happiest when I've done both. So rather than just be a director for hire, I would have pushed more for projects I've written and shows I've created uh, to be the shows I directed. I think I was uh, I got swept up and seduced by really great artists like David Milch and Aaron Sorkin and Kurt Sutter and got and spent Sorry, many, many years, uh, uh, you know, working for them. And I think if I had to do it over again, I would have uh, I would have liked to have spent more time working for myself. Um, I would have also stayed in the theater as well as in television. I love directors that I hear about who are still directing plays and Matt Penn's directing a play. Yeah. So it's, it's great. I love that idea. And I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have, um, I wish I would have kept my feet in both. Would you like to go back to direct the theater anytime in the future? Yeah, I get offers every once in a while to do different uh, plays. Oh, I just, right. you know, it is a big time commitment. Uh, I wrote a musical yeah. called One Red Flower, which is based on soldiers' letters written during the Vietnam War, which was written before I became a director and has been produced in Boston and Washington, D.C. and uh, all around the United States. And uh, my idea is to do that for television. So I'm hoping that in the next year or two, I'll be able to put that together as a as a dramatic television musical which would sort of fuse together all of my different talents okay so moving on to the third and final part of the show you know what words of encouragement could you give for our aspiring directors out there well if you've listened so far you know <laughs> the biggest lesson which is you don't have to know it all but you do have to be mm -hmm. able to ask people for help and you have to see it not as a failing you have to see it as the ultimate strength that you can turn to people and say, hey, I am weak on visual effects. I need your assistance. Will you spend time with me helping me put together the storyboard, explain to me what I can or can't do? You have to be able to, to find the help. Uh, you will find it, but you have to be able to reach out for it. I think that's the most important thing. And then just generally, even as you're doing your first films, I think you have to be authentically you. Don't try to be Steven Spielberg or David mm -hmm. Fincher or Ridley Scott. Be you, do the things that please you, and be as specific about them as possible. When I've seen short films people have mm -hmm. done, the more specific they are to their situation and their story and the things that particular person cares about, the more they really drill down into that, 
the better and more resting they are. It's the whole, you know, the particular becomes universal is the same thing. So if you are authentic in the choices you make and the stories you want to tell, even at the earliest stage, and then if your directing style is authentic, I mean, your directing style, maybe you're super quiet, you depend on a DP, maybe that's it. Maybe you're loud and garrulous and jokey like I am, but not inappropriate, <laughs> then maybe that's it. <laughs> but you also have to find your authentic way of communicating and communicate with people people in that way. So being authentic to yourself and knowing you don't have to know it all. Oh, and I'll add one more thing. It also, if I had it to do all over again, actually, I would say to aspiring directors from the very get-go, be grateful for the people who are helping you make each and every project you do. Expressing your gratitude often and recognizing you have a responsibility to take care of them are two of the best things you can do. That will, that will, um, be incredibly powerful for you as your career continues. If you can be someone who is known to be grateful, someone who's known to write letters after the show is done, to thank people who've donated their time on Saturday to make your short film, that is how you build a reputation in a career and you get people to want to work for you. And as you get larger crews, it still goes on. You have responsibility to them to not do ridiculously long days, to not put them in situations that are unsafe, and also to be thankful and grateful for their help. Well, I think that's uh, amazing advice. Um, yeah, can't top that. I think you've summed it all up there. Thank you so yeah. much. Can people find you on uh, social media? You know, people can find me on the social media. I'm mostly on Twitter at, at Harper Bar, H-A-R-P-A-R-B-A-R. -A -R -A -R. I'm sometimes on the Instagram at hashtag PKC Barclay. But I think you find it if you just look for my name. I'm not on Instagram as much as uh, as Twitter because I, I get my news from Twitter. Uh, but please, uh, you know, follow me and maybe I'll say something you'll enjoy. Well, listen, I'm so inspired by having you on the show. Thank you. You've been an inspiration to me and so many people for so long. It's I love the fact that you've come on the show and you've given us your time, uh, not just for everybody that's listening, but for me also. Well, thank so you so much for asking me, so and much. thanks for doing this. This, would, this could so be much. a great, a great resource to people, and uh, you know, I appreciate your including me as one of those potential resources. Thank you so much, Paris Barkley. Thank you. And that's the show. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can find me at jefftthomas.com or at jefftthomas on Twitter and Instagram. Remember 19 Media.